questions, 47 questions submitted, and there's a number on the each index card. And so while I ask one question, Kathy's going to go around and just randomly, if you want to pick a question, raise your hand, and you'll pick an index card, and that'll be the next question. And we're going to try to get as many questions as possible, randomly, whatever questions come up, and then the, um, each candidate will address the same set of questions. So you have to address each person the same set. And then uh, at the end, there's going to be two questions, but additionally, questions were submitted for particular candidates, and the board has reviewed all of those questions, and there'll be two questions asked for each candidate system. So that's the format for reform. We hope that you'll provide feedback to the school board um, about candidates, and that is electronically on the link that's on the web page. It's also a QR code that you can scan on your phone if you want to do that. That feedback form is uh, anonymous, or you can put your name, your choice, and then also that will close tomorrow night at 5. So, and then the board will get all that feedback. So that's how we're collecting feedback for this process. And we're going to get started with Vince. So you're up. Thank you. It's good to be back in this room. It's been a lot of hours in here watching, at the time, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders in PE and before school and in my two years here between 2007 and 2009. It was a whole lot. And it's good to be back in this building in particular. I had a chance to obviously see all the buildings today and see the great things happening in all the schools. I want to say my name is Ben Swaggerty. I have uh, had an opportunity to spend uh, time on the South Coast. My very first year teaching was in for Mike Weiss. And then later on, I had a chance to, to get back here and be back on the South Coast. And then just as, uh, as recently as five years ago, I spent four years as the uh, principal at the uh, Weeks Park Community Charter School. 7 through 12 in East Park. Um, last five years, I've been over in Mitchell, Oregon. I want to be a superintendent again. I had been prior to coming here to Kansas Valley. And so I got over to Central Oregon in Mitchell. Mitchell is in Weaver County. You know, Pant Hills, we're the closest town to the Pant Hills. Um, but there are more cattle in Weaver County than there are human beings. And so it was a real culture shock for me to go out there. Um, one of the things that uh, I want you to hear from me as a leader is that I'm a leader of people. I think leadership is about growing people. And I, and I have become a leader over the course of my career that has valued the students and the staff and the parents and the community and everybody in the process. And so I believe that my job as a leader is to lead people, to empower them, to give them the ability to, uh, to grow and what they do and support them in what they do because we all work together because our greatest resource are the kids that we have a chance to teach and spend time with. And today I had a chance to go through the buildings and to see all the faces, whether they were little faces or whether they were high school faces or middle school faces. Uh, and of course, it did take even a couple of seconds around some middle school kids and they just came up and said, hey, how's it going? You're dressed up. <laughs> so, so I, I, and I love that. I always have an opportunity to be with middle school kids and they're amazing in that way. They're just so out there. So, and, and I see a lot of faces that, uh, that I have met and seen before or here uh, 14 years ago when I was here. So it's, a, it's been a great day in the community. I also want you to know that um, I'm kind of a humble and really stable kind of leader. Um, I am not as flashy maybe as some of the other folks that might come for you in the next uh, little while. Um, I try to be as solid as a rock. I'm very consistent, I'm predictable, I'm safe. Uh, the people who work with me um, and have spent time with me you know that, uh, that I'm the kind of person you can come to and you can talk to. I have good sense of humor. Um, I'm level-headed and under fire, I stay level-headed. Um, I'm one of those folks that uh, if, you try to, if you try to find the drama in, in the town of Mitchell, you're not going to find it in the school. Uh, and because we've set, we 
we have a climate and a culture in Mitchell that is really positive. And, and it, it is in a lot of ways because when we went in there five years ago, we walked into a place that had a lot of wrong. And we just did the things that we could do to alleviate that by being genuine and authentic and loving the people in the town and being involved and being involved with the kids and really just being who we are as human beings and make sure that, that the people in the building just kind of fostered that. And we had teachers that came and they fostered that. And they stayed and they liked being there. And, and we're speaking with teachers from other districts because they now want to be in the place that I currently am. And it's not just about me, it's about our entire building, it's about all of us. And it's about everybody in our building having a good positive culture. And in the, in the midst of all of the turmoil and COVID and everything associated with that, uh, we were small enough, we actually had a chance to be in school with all our kids every day, starting in the fall of 2020. And it seems like it's a wonderful thing that we had a chance to do that. Except that there was no vaccine yet. And I had the staff members who were definitely afraid of having a kindergartner walk through the door with COVID giving it to them. And so there was a lot of anxiety and there was a lot of things that I know you faced when you came back into school later that same school year and it was required us to be hired. So we've been in a lot of stress, a lot of strain. We live in a world in which we feel like the schools aren't doing a very good job. We had kids that were online and they fall behind. And in Mitchell, we had the best, we had the least amount of drop in student performance of anyone in the state. And we actually are really driven about that. And the reason why was we had the chance to be back with kids in the fall of 2020. We had nine weeks of learning loss. But we had to lead through that. And we did. And we came out really, um, in a really positive manner on the other side. So I'm just going to say, and you do with this, uh, I may not be the flashiest person who's here today. But I probably will not see it. Right? I'm just gonna say, no, I don't know. I don't know shit. Right? I don't know. Well, I know a little bit about some of my other things. But and it's and it's kind of funny, but the reality is I am a very consistent, capable, skilled leader. And I'm not prone to drama. I'm prone to focusing on kids and learning. And all of these spaces that I saw today, my goal was to give them a bright, bright future and to do what I can to make that happen. All right, so the first question is how can North Bend be a model district to impact change in work? When I was here, there was a level of excellence that North Bend had that is still here. You see it in the data, you see it uh, in the community, you see it when I go to the, the buildings. Um, and I think uh, COVID has, has kind of kind of tarnished I mean, everywhere, not just North Bend, all across the state. Uh, COVID's made it more difficult to do what we did, um, in some cases because the people who attendance right now in the North Bend is not as, as good. The data shows that it's low and needs to be higher. So we need to find ways to get kids back in the classroom. But, but all of those pieces, all of those pieces are still here. They are still in place. And for us to be a model for the state means that we need to, to take those pieces and all those parts the great staff members and the community support and, and the people that are here that want to see great things happen in athletics and the band, let's get a hand the band. And the music and the Amherst program, think about that. There's all that excellence that starts at the elementary where I saw them singing today. And then she gets to the years, well, when I was there, she got to hear sixth graders can't play a clear net without a sweep. And then all of a sudden, they're winning the state championship because she has the resources, because she has 
people because of her and the people in the music program, and she did able to build from that. And I think that's how we make that out. We made the resources happen, we put them in the right spot, we hired the right people, we support the people that we already have, and then we try to convince our community that they need it. And I think that's how we make the difference. And we not only get back to where we were pre COVID, but then we move beyond that and make it a model for us. The next question is question 34, which is North Bend faces unique challenges in terms of resource allocation and budget. How would you prioritize resources? To address the needs of students from economically disadvantaged backgrounds while still ensuring high quality education for all. I think what we what was coming to mind is uh, the question was asked had to do with our ability to utilize uh, funding and resources that um, that have become available to us. I, I don't exactly know uh, what your future integrated guidance and your uh, student investment in California is going to be for us. I know that in my world, we utilize those funds that are now really not on time funds. The ESSA funds are going to go away in about a year, but the other SIA funds and those that target resources, um, we push into the area of greatest need. At Mitchell, one of that we had, we didn't have support for uh, kids, multi. Because I just went through a Title III, which is uh, 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 English language learner review in a tiny little district, and I told I, I needed some, I needed to, that kind of a person with that knowledge to help me through that process. And so we need to make sure that we don't, um, that we don't cut so much that, that we actually lose the ability to support the schools. So I would uh, do a, 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 a review of our staff, we would talk to the board and say, well, would you like to go with this? Look at various options, be creative if necessary, and then make the right decision based on our budget. Because of course, number one, we need to have enough resources to do the best we can with our kids. But we can't forget that part of that is the support that comes from the district office.
decision making process, process in the district, especially those who may face barriers to participation due to economic or social disparities. I think one of the things that has been um, the one of the hardest for all the school districts in the state to, to do in the uh, integrated allocation, student investment account allocations, is to have authentic public input and it's required by state law for us to do that. And so, uh, in Mitchell, obviously we're really a lot smaller, but you'd be surprised how many small school districts can find a way to create authentic public input. And I think um, we have done so. We've done so by being creative uh, and how we get that to happen. I think the first thing is we need to genuinely ask for it. And I, I'm pleased at what I see today because I see, I see involved people here today, parents, staff members, and so on and so forth. And I like that. Um, and I think we need to authentically ask and find creative ways to make that happen. Number one. Number two, we need to um, to create the forums. Like, for example, we have student advisory groups that are going to be a part of the law and are going to be rolled out next week. Get on that, make that happen in our schools. We have um, the opportunity to get people involved through electronic meetings, through Zoom, and through uh, other ways, and to get communication out uh, into our uh, community about what's happening here and then to have an opportunity to respond. And so I think we just use every one of those tools, every one of those tools, but ultimately we have to genuinely want to input. My standpoint, when I say to you, I want you to have a real voice. I'm sincere. I want you to have a real voice. And even if the voice is the same, okay? <laughs> Teachers pretend, okay? Okay. I'm, I'm okay with that, okay? You're expressing your voice, and I appreciate that, okay? That is, that's, that's what we need. We don't need everyone to have the same voice. We need everyone to hang out with folks and to bring that together and in the end to do what's best for all of us. This is a final question. Is what collaborative approaches would you employ to engage and involve various stakeholders, such as teachers, parents, and community members, in decision-making processes related to budget development, technology integration, and creating Budget and technology. Budget and technology inclusiveness. I have a question. It's for you. Okay. Um, well, I, I sort of, I sort of just answered that. Okay. In this terms of uh, asking, really asking for honest, legitimate input. Okay, and being good. With it. I think the mechanisms to create that um, in every building. to create um, standing committees that address these issues, the technology issues, the budget. Um, I think we can do that. They're very easy to do because we just need to take the time to put it together and invite people to come. There are people that will come. Okay. You, you are here. Um, we'll be asking you to be a part of those. Any volunteers? Well, I think I need some volunteers. Um, but that's point is, let's, let's make it happen. Uh, sometimes we talk, we kind of paralysis by analysis, we talk too much, we don't just say, here, let's make the committee happen. So, so we'll put together a committee, make it happen, get in the way, and then we'll have conversations about substantive, legal things, and then listen to what they have to say, and you know, and implement this. That's, that's really where it's at. Um, just be genuine and honest and go for it. Okay, so we'll take a 60 seconds for a sprint, you know, we'll, uh, mind, mind melt, we've got our next candidate in the room.
sprinkler and I fixed the roof so that it wouldn't uh, flood the kids out. And when I was up all weekend doing that in a small town, I don't know if you guys know, but it created something called rumors. Anybody heard of those? <laughs> and people were wondering, who is this guy? What is he doing? And when it rained again, the, the water didn't come down through the ceiling of the bathroom. The math teacher came up and approached me in the hallway and she started crying. She was so grateful because they had acclimated just to mop up or you put a bucket, and even the kids were acclimated. And then some guy shows up from you know, out of nowhere and fixes the roof, and they couldn't believe it could be fixed. And you can tell a lot about a community, by the way, it treats its kids the way it treats its school buildings. So I'm going to give you folks here in the room a big compliment. Everything I've seen today, from behavior to kids to perception staff, to chatting down at Geno's where I've heard the sandwich. Uh, I can tell that North Bend community values its children. It makes very obvious. And it's such a joy because so many kids approach me just because I was a bad person. And, uh, and when kids are feeling comfortable and safe in the school environment, they, they approach people like me and they just introduce themselves and say, what are you doing here? So it, it's a true joy. But in Yonkala, so things happen for strange. One, I was politically active or motivated because I had to pass a law to remote elementary school funding in order to fund the school because it was broke. And I ended up getting that done single-handedly. And uh, when I left, or I also passed a bill called Open Enrollment, where which would allow at the time public schools to have charter schools. So I took the opportunity to leave you and call up in you know having successfully achieve my goal of getting the school solved, getting the building stored up, and getting funding set up. And I went to an awesome school district, which was 120 some odd kids. And I was the only administrator. It was a tremendous amount of work. So I was also a school director and a school counselor, and et cetera, et cetera. And we did an open enrollment school, and suddenly revenue and enrollment started increasing. And that steadily increased over the years. And in 2015, we chartered the school district. And the district continued to thrive. Pretty soon, we had a couple, you know, a little over a million and a half dollars of reserve in the bank. We had computers for every kid. And we started opening up programs like wig shop, art, music, things that hadn't been and that people thought would never be in that old school district. And then COVID hit. And my, my nice, quiet kingdom was out of because I have a school board that said, you got to keep school open. And that's a call order. So I used my political connections. And you may remember the small remote or the small school exception where small schools, 250 kids are in a good sale. Anybody remember that? Okay. So I burned up a lot of political capital making it happen. I worked politically and wrote a lot of policy for uh, both political parties. And I also worked with Governor Brown and Persia. But it's a public employee retirement system for those that have no purpose. So I had some connections that I was able to use, and we were able to stay open. And then we did something remarkable. I had to work with the union, and I uh, had to work with staff because the big fears, you know, everyone was afraid we didn't know. Will people show up? Will they show up to work? Well, to everybody's credit, I had 100% of the teaching staff show up to work, even though I offered every single one the option to work from home or to get paid and not Remember that was not But once the school was going to be open, and once teachers said, no, I want to be with kids, we think closing the school is bad. So we stayed open, we were the exception. We stayed open in K-12, all through the long days of COVID. And that's what grew my internet feed, if you guys have noticed, substantially. Because I had to take on the government to stay, to keep school open, take on the government to get the Eugene School District to serve my special needs daughter, who they had abandoned for a year and Work on getting the uh, OSAA to go ahead and hold sports because it was one of the primary reasons why kids were trying to harm themselves or worse in themselves. And it was a brutal, awful, ugly battle. But some good things came out of it. One is while all the other school districts were struggling, I'll see thrived. We ended up increasing our revenue to fourteen million dollars in one year. I don't know about you guys, but that's, that was a two years worth of operating capital on top of you know, our operating. And 
what we received for that was tremendous scrutiny and pain. But we were hopeful. Kids were connected to in person learning. And we had most of our programs up and running, busing, etc. Now, COVID's long past, and I have all the stars of having been through all that. But time, I call it the old game of a lie will go all the way around the world before truth gets its own issue. But now that we're all past, regardless of our position and our perspectives on this, that, and the other, what made me most famous is when my school board decided to give parents the rights back. And they put me out front to take the students and nerds. And I work for the board. School super, superintendent works for the board, no one else. So we, we did that. And boy, did the government come pounding and pounding. The teachers union, the SEIU, OHA, CDC, other federal agencies that didn't know existed. And you have to stand in the fire and focus on the goal that you're trying to accomplish, which was to give parents the right to decide on something that was so divisive at the time that it was harming the school climate, which was massive. The kids were rebelling against massive, and all of this rubbish was created. So we took that stand. And one of my favorite claims to fame is the state gave me eight days to get kids back in masks. And I wrote a response to that. I gave them eight days to respond and get everybody out of masks. And on the eighth day, they announced the end of masks. That, that merit 
and achievement create diversity. It's what makes us all unique and exceptional. And it was extremely evident in that group of high school kids. And for that, I'm telling you, that was a lifetime treat for me. Uh, good job, Mark. And I'm, I'm telling you, I've been to other places, I consult, I do other things. Uh, I, you should be congratulated. So there's the answer.
stay with North Bend if hired? Well, I, I would say a district like this is an undiscovered gem based on what I saw today, it only confirms. Uh, it's interesting, you know, I've had people ask that question from Mark, you know, you're a political guy, you know, why, you know, why would you just come to North Bend? So you only know the value of something when you leave. So I left education to run for governor. Not my best idea, but I did. Uh, and that's when you realize how much you miss something. So I'll be able to come here and serve this community, right, wrong, or different. It would be the greatest honor of my life, and I would do it for many, many years until uh, the community or the board decides I don't need Because that is how it works in this game. And to me, it's an honor. So uh, I have a long track record of supporting my staff, supporting my students. And uh, I guarantee you, if, if we break bread in this, and, and I'm fortunate to be chosen, you will have my support. It was 
every two weeks, night. We go along our road. I said, but kids are kids were protected. They were connected to education. And that was my number one duty. The other thing too is uh, my license is getting ready to expire. True, I've already applied to extend it. Uh, I got plenty of time. It's not to expire to my birthday in July. Uh, and uh, it will be extended. I've already corresponded with the TSPC. There's a process. Fingerprints are being reviewed, and it will be expired or uh, uh, renewed. And the reason is, is you know, when people turn you in for an ethics complaint or investigation, which you're going to get if you take on the government. I don't know what you guys, but when you take on the government, you're going to get investigated. Uh, those things don't bear anything. They don't bear anything to licensing. So there's no reason for them not to extend my license. So, uh, so that, that answers that one. I think there was a third one, right? Uh, see, oh, gross neglect of duty for family. Is that one of them? No, not the funding. No, the funding. Um, which one? Help me point this out. It's a whole page here, guys. Oh, I'm sure the district doesn't lose millions of dollars in funding like the previous year. First of all, I don't see the school district did not lose any dollar. See, I did my homework. So I knew that the only funds they could freeze. There's a difference between freezing funds and losing funds. The only thing that they could freeze really was the COVID bill, which I had already spent an appreciable amount of. I drew those funds in. But I had left the next day for those for future years. So they froze money and they weren't in access. We had $4.5 million in cash. So we had to be the district that took this game because we were the only district financially solvent enough to take the risk. This is something the public didn't know. But my board knew and I did. And what's powerful is, is how C ended up not paying any funds, which is what I saw along to the media, the hospital media. I don't know if you guys know the hospital media, but there are some out there. Uh, and that's unfortunate because we should be reporting facts, not opinion. And if we're going to report opinion, we should stay with it. So, uh, what has happened is now C lost no money, they received ultimately. And, but, all other school districts were able to uh, get kids out of mass and parents their rights back soon. Somebody had to really cost that. The best that we were one of the most financially solvent school districts in the state. And that's what's powerful. Now, during COVID, my teachers and my classified staff enjoyed the highest percentage of pay increase of any school district in the state. We even paid COVID bonus pay through the first year in February. Every employee got $2,500, including part-time employees and substitutes. Teachers got an extra thousand, obviously they're certified. For every month they worked, chose to work during COVID, they got a reward for you. It was a lot of fun going to school board saying, it's about 800 So when the employees did that, there was a big kerfuffle about it. Why, why, why are they doing this? So I had a nice happy and I walked in and told people, you're getting this money because at the end of the year I said, if you take the risk and you show it over, and we are successful in keeping kids safe from COVID, I would go to the board and all ships would be risen. Everyone would be compensated. Of course, then that jar of things would bring people like, oh, that's right, it is. And I said, you have earned every dollar. Every dollar. You know, that money made a big difference for people in a very difficult time. So I don't, I don't regret that. My favorite is when Fred Meyer copied me. Do you remember Fred Meyer? The store. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. You did it.
superintendents in Oregon and Indiana, you know, last year in Washington and other places, California advocating for that. So um, I'm proud to be a superintendent. I spend a lot of time as much as possible getting out into the classroom uh, because that's where I escape and I love being around the kids, especially uh, I would say the FFA uh, uh, program. Uh, I'm actually going to be at the Lamb Show dealing with uh, very scary things tomorrow. So uh, anyway, uh, that's a little bit about me. So I'm happy to take uh, uh, take the questions on the, and the mic over. Yeah. So uh, the first question is, how can North Bend be a model district to impact change in the world? Thank you. So, how can we be a model, uh, model district? Well, I, I, I guess I would be remiss in not stating that COVID changed everything. So, every district that I have uh, been in or exposed to had a couple of uh, uh, years of pretty tough times, and there was learning loss that occurred. And there is uh, every district that I'm aware of nationally, because I still stay in touch with my national colleagues. They uh, uh, they're all working very hard to get kids up to speed. It hit some grade levels worse than others, but it really impacted all the kids. So I think there are some, from what I can tell, there are some great things going on here in North Bend that always room for improvement. And so I am a data informed person, so I look at uh, all kinds of academic achievement data in order to see uh, areas where improvements can be made. Uh, in, in a district to help move a district forward. So I think that should be the number one uh, topic on a strategic plan is how to raise student achievement. That's my, my personal opinion. Uh, and so as I've uh, been involved in developing many strategic plans for exactly, uh, that has been number one, uh, making sure that uh, we focus on student achievement. And that has a lot of components to it, like, uh, I mean, extracurriculars are a big part of that. They incentive for students. To, to perform uh, at a higher level academically. There is an incentive there. Um, of course, using that previously referenced test data to uh, see what areas that the weakest students have uh, and then addressing them accordingly through intervention. So I had a, I had a slideshow, and uh, so one of the things that I, I talked about in that slideshow is the Institute uh, for Research and Reform and Education, and it's a comprehensive database. I know that is something that uh, is important here in the district, but it is the best I've ever seen in, in my uh, 40 years uh, in education. And it is uh, it has various uh, components to it that feed into a, a, uh, a composite uh, rating for students. It's, it's very revealing. And so we use it in why uh, Douglas County uses it comprehensively throughout the uh, the, the entire county, and uh, so anyway, it was it was something that I felt was worth mentioning uh, moving moving forward. So uh, I think just getting in for me, my strategy is to get into a district and and look at the inner workings of the district in order to see uh, what great things are happening and how we can uh, augment those uh, through a team approach. Which should be very important to make sure that uh, we're always. Uh, Endeavoring to improve. Okay, the uh, next question is that North Bend faces unique challenges in terms of resource allocation and budgeting. How would you prioritize resources to address the needs of students from economically disadvantaged backgrounds while still ensuring high quality education for all? Yeah, thank you. And, and so budgeting is a, a process. And so most districts use a rollover budget uh, to compartmentalize the spending from the previous year. I did take note that there was, I want to say, it was a 10% reduction uh, in the budget. So that those, those uh, uh, represent hard decisions. And I think that if you're going to, uh, again, I really need to get into the budget dissect it and work with the fiscal services director in order to see where that money is going. Ideally, uh, you know, the maximum amount of uh, resources will go to students. And 
and student uh, achievement and uh, increased opportunities for uh, uh, our secondary students in the CE pathways. So, and also there is the uh, possibility of secure grants. Uh, so the IRRE data that I was talking about earlier, that is actually funded through the Ford Foundation. And so the uh, district here in North Bend is uh, an ideal candidate for that because the Ford uh, Foundation was started as part of those workforce products. And so um, there are lots of uh, places out there that we can secure monies to help uh, backfill uh, any, any cuts that, that we have. Probably not all of them, but I think there needs to be a process for how we bring people together to talk about those, those deficits and how we are going to uh, you know, make, make cuts as necessary. I, I, I got a student a question today that was very interesting. Uh, uh, a young lady who is a uh, uh, track athlete, and she was curious about that, how we would prioritize any, any extra curricular cuts. So that, that was pretty fun. She did, you know, she, she did javelin from her, very good javelin from her. I just told her I didn't want any outrage from her, but she's a minor javelin. So. Anyway, I, th I think that it just is, a, is a process that needs to be worked through when you have uh, looming cuts that involves the board, that involves the community, involves the leadership, that involves everybody in the community because it impacts everybody in the community, especially the students. The next question is what are your thoughts on school choice and COVID? Well, I mean, school choice is out there. There is nothing that um, uh, that changes a student to be in a public school. And so, if, if a student wants to attend a charter school, well, that's open. If they want to attend an online school, that's open. Yeah. So, uh, I would never stand in the way of that. Would I prefer that they attend a public school? Of course. And I think that the way you stem that is to have a great public school system that has many, many offerings. So uh, like any other organization, you want to be the best, right? So being the best, uh, people aren't going to be interested in going to other places uh, for uh, to receive their education. Again, COVID, I had this conversation uh, with, a, with a colleague recently, and they lost one third of their student population. So where did they go? And they said, oh, I don't know. And I, I said, well, and this was from Alaska. I said, well, you need to track them down. He said, I can try. But, I mean, there's been kids that just disappeared off the radar and we don't know where they went. So I think over time, we will see them come back, but the sooner the better because they're a representing, uh, they're, they're experiencing learning loss along the way. So, so whatever we can do to bring them back uh, would be uh, desirable. But, I, I just, you know, personally, I can't, uh, I would never stand in the way of someone with school choice, but we just need to be the best for that, and then we won't have to worry about it. All right, the next question is, how long do you plan to stay with North Bend if hired? Well, I would love to stay with Bend. Uh, if, uh, if there's uh, a welcoming community, uh, uh, I think it's a beautiful place. I grew up in Eastern Washington, so I'm not unfamiliar with the Washington and the Oregon Coast. So if, uh, if that opportunity presented itself, uh, I would be more than that. Uh, I bring a lot of experience to uh, the field of education, so I can learn sweatshirt over there and I thought he was a Washington State Cougar. I'm sorry. I know I'm a Yeah, see, we got a Cougar in here, no Cougars. But uh, anyway, um, as long as there's no Huskies, you're Okay, I'm not really living very close. So, uh, anyway, um, yes, the answer is yes, in short. So. Okay. Why, why not? Yes. Yes. 
So this is one of those pretty topics uh, in education today, uh, sex ed, and of course, I mean, I, I believe, and I haven't looked at that policy, but I'm sure there is an opt-in, uh, opt-out uh, policy, or certainly an opt-out policy. So uh, I, I just think that we're in an age where people have to have uh, flexibility to make those important decisions for their students standing in a way that's not productive or necessarily Yeah, I mean, uh, people, we can't force uh, something down uh, individuals' throats. It's just ineffective. So. All right, next question is uh, North Bend is administratively top heavy. What administrative cuts do you plan to make? Well, first of all, I, I don't know that that's true. Uh, it may be, but maybe that speaks to the uh, analysis uh, when you come into the of how things are set up. You know, is this administrative structure uh, uh, set up in a way that forwards the district in an efficient and effective manner? It may be that there is uh, administrative restructuring. We just, I just don't know. And, and so um, uh, maybe, maybe that's accurate. Yeah, but I mean, I'm not going to know that until. I actually have a chance to look at it and see. Uh, and that uh, the, the board had asked me today for a 100 day plan, and I renamed mine to 100 days of listening uh, because I think that's really important to listen and, and analyze along the way. It does take time. I feel like in July, right then this year, I'm just kind of now we can handle a lot of our uh, inner workings of the district and see uh, where things are at. So that would certainly be something um, that I would look at and, and you know, try to work my way through to see what would be best for the district in terms of efficiency and, and still getting, uh, uh, getting the job done. Sometimes, sometimes there people perceive that uh, there uh, is a stop at administration and, and, and actually they're just working very hard to do this before. So again, you know, we just take analysis. This question is, what are your top two to three issues priorities you plan to address as a superintendent? So, uh, I'm glad you only asked me for three. But I think uh, raising student achievement, I've uh, previously mentioned that, and focusing on uh, how we can improve attendance. Uh, I know attendance is an issue here. Uh, it's an issue in a lot of places, and it, again, it, it is relevant to that topic of how to um, figure out where those kids left and talking with parents that uh, uh, don't regularly bring their students to school. Uh, just a little metric here for you. If you miss 20 days of school per year, for whatever reason, uh, by the time in between the uh, kindergarten through 12th grade year, you've missed over a year of school by the time you graduate. And that's very significant. And there are kids that uh, have missed um, well over 20 days. I'm dealing with one right now that missed uh, 57 this year. And, and that's usually uh, problematic and it impacts their grades. Their behaviors, and so getting a handle on that would be very important. And then I think looking at—I uh, uh, had some great conversations today with uh, Title One staff and reading interventionists, and so I felt very good about that as I looked at, at their tiered intervention and progress with students on the wall. And then that look at the post-secondary piece: are our kids uh, doing their FAFSA? Are they creating four-year plans or more five-year plans, whatever the case may be, but for sure four-year plans, planning that post-secondary uh, set of opportunities, whether that's a four-year college at Washington State University or, uh, you know, trade uh, along the way. And, you know, Marvel's uh, college here, I was actually kind of stunned to drive around the campus. I almost got lost, but I could be still driving around in there. Uh, not found my way out, but um, I think there's some great opportunities.
opportunities here to develop that post-secondary piece working with council staff and site administration. So that's the thing. Thank you. 
in the meantime, you know, a human resources director left the district. And, and I jumped at that opportunity to also take on that role. And, and to then not, you know, not take anything more from it, to learn from it, to help work with our wonderful staff and, and people in the community, and, and, and re, you know, reinvest those funds back into the school district. So um, me as an educator, I'm here to serve. I believe in serving leadership. I believe in making other people's lives better, putting students and the community first, uh, putting our organization first. And that's what I intend to do as your superintendent. North Bend is already a model district. What can we do? We can continue doing the things we do so well. I mean, you all of you that, that work here and, and the parents, the community, your heart and soul is really invested in, in this district and in our students already. So we continue down that path and that journey together. Um, we identify, um, we, you know, we look at the data, we identify for growth, opportunities for, for addressing some of the learning loss through COVID. And I was really proud to be at Hillcrest when we were able to bring all of our students back onto our campuses and really start addressing some of that learning loss, you know, right there on, on, on the front line for our students. We need to continue that process. Um, we need to invest in our people. We need to invest in training so that our staff is confident and want to stay. Um, and we need to make sure that we provide opportunities for every child to feel welcome and successful at school. You know, academics, yes, incredibly important. Alternative pathways, our CTE programs, our top notch, you know, world class culinary medals. We, we just have these amazing programs in place. And so we're going to build on those, build on that success, and keep it going. Athletics, again, phenomenal, phenomenal athletic program. The community is 100% invested in that. We're going to keep building on that, keep that going, going strong. Student clubs, keep, keep working with student clubs. You know, we want students to feel happy at school. They should and they deserve to feel happy and safe. When, when we look at our budget allocations, um, we, we, we definitely want to ensure that all students are receiving what they need. Um, you know, our students from economically challenged backgrounds, you know, they, 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 they can struggle and, and they need some extra attention. And they, and they need people around them that care about them. And I see that happening in our schools day to day. Um, when it comes to our budget allocations, we need a we need community. We need staff input. We need, we need parents, you know, to tell us what is it that you're seeing that we need. So we're, we're going to, you know, part do this participatory budget process where, where your input is gathered, heard, and feedback is given to you about where we're prioritizing our spending. You deserve to see that. You deserve to know that if we set some goals and spend some money on something, that there's going to be an outcome tied to that. And if there's not an outcome, why? I don't, I don't think anybody would expect this to be perfect 100% of the time, but probably what you want to know is what are the issues we're seeing and what is our plan to address those issues? And if we're not successful addressing them, what are we going to do next? And listening to the parents first, the community, our staff, and our students is how we're going to do that. Take that away from them. I think that when we create a, 
school culture and climate where every student feels valued and feels welcome and feels important, they're all going to want to come here anyway. So Open World is going to benefit us in the end because North Bend is the premier district on the Oregon Coast. So, um, you know, that's basically it. There's no more time. I plan to finish my career here. I moved here for a reason. You know, I researched the district long before I moved here. This is this is where I wanted to be. I love it here. I mean, you know, this is heaven on earth. You know, look where we're at. Come on, it's, it's fantastic. Why would anybody do this? I came from you know a super crowded place in Southern California. It's hot and dry. You know, I, I don't want to live like that. I'm standing here not just for the view and, and for everything. Around us, but for you, you know, you, you've given me so much. I'm gonna give it back. Certain students struggle. We need to find out what is causing that struggle. 
you know, what barriers is that student facing, what challenges, and what systems do we have in place to support them and to support our staff? Because when we address that, we really address the culture and climate of the whole school, right? The whole district. We, we get our students feeling happy to be at school, feeling like they want to come through those doors and they can share their feelings with the adults around them. And, and we want our staff to feel the same. You know, you walk through those doors, I want you to feel excited to be at work, be excited about what you do. You, you, you got to do this especially because you love children and you, and you love education. So we want to make that a safe environment for the staff as well. I think that goes right in straight up the change of the parents. We want the parents to feel welcome, happy with our schools, and to know that, that their voices are heard, their input is valued. And, and so I think that. That leads me to that second, that second kind of goal is just really creating this transparent environment for you all so that you know what we're doing as a district. So that you can see that we're making decisions based on data and based on feedback. And we're setting goals based on that and we're going to share the outcomes with it. Um, so creating this sense of transparency, bringing the parents into this, and, and really um, addressing the, the behavioral challenges that we're seeing. You know, on top of that, we want to continue to address learning loss. You know, we were just talking today um, over at Hillcrest in the Title Reading Program, and I've got some data from North Bay. You know, th these amazing outcomes are coming out of some of our early interventions. You know, we want all of our kids to be reading at grade level by third grade. How do we make sure that happens? Because that's setting these kids up for a trajectory of success for the rest of their lives. So, we got academics, we got your culture, we got behavior, and we got transparency. Why you're going another route 
and, and we will appreciate that feedback. So there are going to be times there's going to be some, probably not, but let's hear more about that. You know, we're engaged in negotiations right now for certified stuff. They heard about what was last night. So um, it's definitely not just a yes across the board. And uh, at the same time, there's a reason why these viewpoints are being expressed, why is it that, why that certification is desired, and, and that in itself tells a story that we need to listen to, and that I would need to listen to as a superintendent and, and address.